You just have to do the next thing you know to do with no sense of where it's going. You have to build a relationship with the unknown. Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. If you're ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. Today's guest, Boyd Vardy, is an expert on tracking. Boyd is an artist of experience. His passion is to create transformational experiences for himself and others as a way to explore what it means to truly live. Boyd has written a book called The Lion Tracker's Guide to Life and another book called Cathedral of the Wild, An African Journey Home. Boyd grew up on the Londolozi Game Reserve, which is about a 60 square mile large game reserve in South Africa. In my own learning journey in recent years, I have felt called to learn more directly from nature and also from my own embodied wisdom, the somatic awareness and that kind of thing. And these are things that Boyd talks about and teaches. You can learn more about Boyd by visiting boydvardy.com. You can pick up either one of his books. I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Boyd Vardy. Boyd, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Great to be here with you. Boyd, will you tell me, please, what's life about? Life to me is about uh, discovering how to align your own harmony with its intelligence, how to become whole, and how to develop the awareness that allows your essence and your gifts and your magic to flow into the world. And what I've experienced is that the more you go inward and attune with what the Buddhists call true nature or uh, what they call in the East, the unfolding Tao, what they call in Native American cultures, your medicine way, the more you attune to the unique frequency of your own being, the more uh, life flows through you and the more you find yourself on a current, uh, doing gives way to a kind of knowing that, uh, that flows through you and, and allows you to bring yourself fully to co-create with the energetic field that life is itself. You know? and, and life to me is an innately powerful, kind, healing current that I am a part of. Um, and my goal is to, to be as aligned with that as possible. Uh, and so, I mean, that would be my best attempt right off the bat <laughs> at a very, very big question. Yes, for sure. Well, thank you for, for that. And I'm, I'm interested to, to hear you talk about life as a kind, like life as kindness, where life is also sometimes violent, dangerous, uh, for some creatures short, Right. And you have had encounters with black mambas, with uh, crocodiles, right? Other dangerous creatures from a very early age. Will you tell me what was it like growing up where you grew up? So I grew up in the wild eastern part of South Africa. And um, from a very young age, I was taught the way of the wild by some of the best Shangan trackers in the world men who lived out on the land, who could read the earth, who could follow an animal for hours and hours by its tracks. And whilst I had numerous, you know, what you would consider dangerous encounters, um, what I found was that that environment had a way about it. That environment, there was, a, there was a kind of language that operated in that environment. There was a language of the wild. And the more I learned that language, strangely, the safer that environment became. And the more attuned I became to that environment, the, uh, the more I realized that the animals actually spoke to you very honestly in their body language and their behavior. And there was a way to be attuned to it that made it safe. Now, you're right, I did have encounters. Um, when I was 10 years old, I was lying on a termite mound and I was watching some impala and at that stage of my life, I was still hunting for the pot. And uh, suddenly I felt a movement on my leg and I looked down and a black mamba, which is one of the most dangerous and venomous snakes in the world was crawling over my legs. Um, 
And immediately my father was lying next to me. I grabbed him and I said, dad, there's a mamba. And he started looking around like, where, where is it? And I glanced downward. I said to him, don't move dad, don't move. Cause I had been taught from a very young age that um, when close to a dangerous snake, the key is to stay still. And so again, it was an extremely dangerous situation, but there was a way of handling it that made it safe. And so we lay there still as the snake crawled across our legs. And then at a certain point, it started to slither away from us and it got to a point where it was far enough away. And I remember my dad grabbed me and he said, let's go. And he ran over the top of this termite mound, this anthill, punched through a thorn bush and, uh, and came out the other side and, and we were unscathed. But we were unscathed because of the way we reacted in the situation. And that became absolutely a critical learning. In the wild, uh, you can teach yourself to react accordingly. And, and mostly if you do that, it can become a very, very safe environment. Mm. You've written a book called The Lion Tracker's Guide to Life. Who did you write this book for and why did you write it? Uh, brilliant. You know, I think that on some level, uh, it was one of those books that, you know, people ask me how long it took to write. It was one of those books that came out um, in six weeks. It's not a long book. It's a, it's a shorter book. It came out very quickly, but really it was the culmination of actually about five or six years of living a very strange journey. And what happened, and I guess I wrote it for anyone um, who was looking to live in, in what we call the medicine way, to live inside of the expression of their gifts, anyone who was at a transformational juncture in their life. I think that it's a more masculine book. Um, and it was talking to men finding their way through transformations. And although it's for everyone, I think I was in a more masculine uh, discovery while I was writing it. But what it really was is, it was the coming together of two very strange life paths. And the first was as a young man uh, growing up around these Shangan trackers and spending hours out in the wild watching the way a tracker um, finds a path and follows it and finds his way to something that he's looking for. At its core, tracking is about finding what you're looking for. And I watched how the, the, the mentality of the tracker, I watched the approach of the tracker, I watched the resilience and persistence of the tracker. I watched how a tracker developed awareness. And at that time, I thought I was learning how you would follow the faint trail of a lion, for example, miles across an unknown wilderness. And then when I was about 23 years old, uh, you know, and this was the second part of the life path. When I was about 23 years old, uh, I was at a time in my life where I was extremely shut down. I had been um, a victim of violent crime. I had experienced trauma um, in various ways. And the result of that was that a part of me had become numb and frozen. That's the only way that I know how to describe it. Something was very shut down. I was, I was lost and I felt like I couldn't find my path. There were, life had no taste to it. Things had gone gray. And at that time I was working as a safari guide and I met an incredible uh, woman uh, by the name of Martha Beck, who became my mentor. And it was one of those strange things. Like I was the safari guide and she arrived, you know, on the safari and immediately the way she started talking started to catch my attention. And one of the things she said was that the transformation, um, the restoration of, of our planet and nature will come out of a profound transformation in human consciousness. And, you know, this idea struck me and we struck up this dialogue and then eventually after, a, you know, four or five days of me being the guide, taking her out on safari, eventually one morning she turned and she looked at me. We were in, in the car park. We had just been out on safari. And she said, you know, I can see where you are. I can see how lost and, and how shut down you are inside. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm here for you. I'm ready to talk to you when you're ready. And there was something so strange about being seen like that. And of course, she was an incredible healer. And, and she had that gift that a healer has to see. And I remember standing there in the car park and, and just breaking. Someone had seen this place inside of me that was so lost and I started to cry. And, um, you know, I was meant to be the macho safari guide and I was crying and this woman was just holding me. And she became my mentor. And, and what she did as a healer, she started to help me find my way back to a very essential 
um, wild and no, and, and part of myself that knew what my mission was. And she began to mentor me. She helped me tune back into my body. She helped me tune back into the feelings and curiosities that were guiding me. And what I started to see was an incredible tracker operating in front of me. And she wasn't tracking a lion. She was tracking a part of me that knew what my purpose and mission was. And as I started to do my own work, attuning to that place and finding that place, these two strange life paths came together. The way and the mentality of the tracker that I grew up with in, in the wild and the way of the inner tracker. And I suddenly started to see that the approach, the mentality, the way that a tracker found his way through difficult, unknown terrain onto the trail of something and then became present with that trail was the same way that all of us has to go through transformation. And so these two very strange paths came together and that, you know, I think of my work now as, as the work of an inner tracker and what I offer people is the way of the tracker to find what I call the track of your own life, this unique essential gift you have to offer. And the trackers have so much to teach us in finding that. I think that's so beautiful. And part of what I love about that is that innately it honors the individuality and the uniqueness of each of our paths. It's not like, Hey, here's the way I've got the solution, you know, uh, the well, answer I mean, for everyone. That, that's such a, that's such an important thing because the first thing is, you know, is that your track will be different from anyone else's. It will be unique. And actually, I think of finding the track of your life as the discovery of your authentic path. And, and the thing about it is, is you can't look into the world around you and find it. The ideals that, that the world offers, offers are not it. You know, the, the world tells you two things. It sort of tells you, it offers you a set of ideals. And it says, if you achieve these ideals, you will be happy. And once you start coaching people, you quickly realize that I, the two things happen. Either people live into the ideal, you know, the money, the success, the status. And when they realize it, um, they realize that's not it. Or we live in a constant state in this society of the feeling that we've never quite achieved. We've never quite gotten to where we could have got to. You know, and both of these places are built into the almost psychological structure of the culture the feeling that I achieved it and it's paper in my mouth or I've never quite been good enough. I never quite got there. And the way of the tracker says, no ideal outside of you is what you're looking for. What you're looking for is your unique way. And the way, the way to begin to find that is to start to tune into the way of the tracker. So, you know, what does it mean to tune into the way of the tracker? Well, all tracking begins when you begin to hear a call. So for example, you know, for us out in Africa, all tracking begins with when you hear that lion roar somewhere out there in the dawn, pre-dawn light, a lion roars somewhere out there in the wilderness. And the first movement of the tracker is that although he's roaring somewhere out there and we can use our ears to pinpoint a general direction, there is no certainty about where that animal is. And the first movement of the tracker is to go without knowing. Every morning as trackers, when we head out into the wilderness, we open ourselves and we move towards a tremendous amount of uncertainty, you know, and when you start working in transformational processes, and you'll know this from your coaching work, I think of all the people who I've sat with who have said to me, you know, when, I, when I'm absolutely certain what the next move in my life is, then I'll make the big leap, then I'll, then I'll start making the changes. And what I would say to anyone who starts the journey of inner tracking is, this journey actually begins with starting to do things without being certain where you're going. You know, my, my mentor always used to say to me as a tracker, the war cry of the tracker is, I don't know where I'm going, but I know exactly how to get there. You just have to do the next thing you know to do with no sense of where it's going. You have to build a relationship with the unknown. The next thing that you'll need is, you know, we talk a lot about the first track. If you think about a tracker out there in the wilderness, and I'll, I'll just give a little framework and then we can, uh, you know, we can dance around, uh, around that. But you think about when you get out there, um, there's an infinite wilderness. That lion could have walked anywhere, you know, but when you get on that track, you have a first track and then you have a next first track and then you have a next first track. 
And it's in that way that the trackers dial down the infinite possibilities in a vast wilderness of where that animal could have gone to a moment of presence and then a next moment of presence and then a next moment of presence. And so in transformational processes, we say go without knowing. And then all you need to do is the next thing you know to do, the next thing you know to do, the next thing you know to let go of the outcome and just do the next thing that feels good, the next thing that feels good. The other thing that trackers will do is they develop what they call track awareness. So track awareness is your capacity to teach yourself to see a track. And if you could imagine, you know, brilliant, if you and I were out in the wild together and we walked down a path and I'm a tracker and I've attuned my eye with practice to very subtle scuff marks and the way a rock moves. I walk down that path. I see a whole lot of information that you maybe wouldn't see. And that to me is the fascinating idea. The idea that there is information there, but you have to attune yourself to see it. So some of the work of becoming an inner tracker is developing track awareness. You have to teach yourself to see your track. You have to realize that there's information there, but you have to start attuning to it. That's a very, that was an incredible idea to me when I got into transformational work. There is a part of you that actually knows what your essence and gifts are, but you have to start tuning into it. So then, you know, how do we develop track awareness? Well, one of the ways to do that is to start to attune to the way that your body speaks. What actually, not as a rational idea, but what in your body starts to make you feel expansive and alive? You know, if you watch yourself through your day, where was the moment where you actually felt an energetic openness and curiosity arrive in you? Where did you find yourself sitting forward in your chair with curiosity? Where did you feel yourself energized and more alive? That's how you tune to your track awareness. So, I mean, I've given you a few things there. There's more in it, but, you know, that's what I started to see. Um, I started to, as I started to do my inner work and, and transform my life into a more essential place, I started to see, man, every morning these trackers go without knowing. They work on a first track and then a next first track. They have tuned themselves to track awareness. They've taught themselves to see specific things. They're in tune with their bodies. As they, as they follow the animal, they can almost feel the pace and the speed at which the animal is moving. And they've moved out of rational knowledge and they're feeling the animal in their body. So I started to just see everything differently and apply it from tracking to finding what I was looking for. And I know I've been on a ramble there, but I hope that gives you a bit of a framework about how these things started to come together as a psyche, as an approach, as a mentality. Yeah, no, absolutely. And a few things that come up for me in this one is about, I think, I think is traditionally Western, but the desire to have a formula, to have an algorithm, to, uh, you know, to know, and then what do we do with it? And what, what's the benefit of it? And all this, that's immediately yeah. of the mind, right? So there's that. And, and, and that's, that's interesting just for me to observe now, but what I, what I tend to believe is it's useful if someone can see something for themselves, right? Like if they've heard something that you just said, whether it's about developing track awareness and like, oh, or, and they make the connection of, oh, that's how I feel in my body. Or if it's looking for and following first tracks or going without knowing, right? That all this is, I'm sure that Eastern teachers have said the same things in different ways, but it's the same thing, right? So I'm fascinated well, by that. And then I'm also, uh, sorry, I, I just want to say this here too about it's a process. It is a process, right? I love that. I mean, I mean, the two things that you've picked out there couldn't be more accurate. Um, and, you know, from the time we are young, we are told we need to know and we need to do it right. And there's an entire education system that is built around knowing and, and getting it right. Mm -hmm. And so by the time we arrive at a, a place in our life where we are ready for a transformational process, we are programmed that we should know what this next movement is and we should, and we've got to get it right. And you're right in the East, you know, of course, the high, the what is most herald, herald is, is the don't know mind. You know, in the pursuit of knowledge, every day something is added. In the pursuit of wisdom, every day something is dropped. Um, would be a more Eastern philosophy. And so, part of if you're out there and you are in a change of relationship, at uh, looking to change careers, have arrived at a place in your life where you feel like nothing is actually feeding you. 
have arrived at a point in your career where you know it's time for something different and you're about to go into transition, you know, certainly that conditioning of now, what's the next thing? I need to know what the next thing is, is going to be absolutely up there for you. And what's actually going to be required is that you give yourself the space to begin to be in a process as a tracker. It's not going to happen instantly. I mean, now and again, someone will get blinding inspiration and see like, that's my next thing. But usually it's an opening to allowing yourself to be in a transformative process that will take time. And that will require you to not know a lot whilst paying new attention. And that is the discipline of the tap tracker to pay attention again. So many of us, I, I think that almost being human, part of being human is that you will as a matter of archetypal course, fall asleep in your own life. And you will have to wake yourself up in your own life. And that always begins when we start paying attention again. Yeah. Um, so giving ourselves the process, uh, letting ourselves not know in the process, and then just something like saying, okay, you know, if you're listening to this right now, I'm just going to start to notice what makes me feel more alive. What are the actions? What are the practices? Who are the people who, when I'm with them, I feel more alive? Because I am 100% certain that where there is more of that energetic in your body feeling of aliveness, there's more of what's essentially um, authentically for you. I mean, I tend to agree. I tend to agree. But I'm also really curious about what about the substances or the activities that are maybe not healthy for us, that bring us incredible amounts of aliveness, whether it's video games or drugs or just unsafe, you know, driving at high speeds, base jumping. Like at what point is that, that call to aliveness actually something to be avoided? Well, you know, what I would, what I would say, and I don't know about uh, like extreme sports, like base jumping and stuff, because I don't, I don't understand that chemistry. But what I would say was something like drugs, um, overeating, you know, oh, I feel so good doing this, give me that, is that what you find if you actually pay attention is that the way it leaves you feeling post that encounter uh, is actually negative. So there's a brief moment of pleasure and, you, and, you know, dressed up as aliveness, but actually the way it leaves you feeling overall, if you're really honest with yourself, is depleted. Mm -hmm. is not feeling good about yourself, is feeling more depressed. And so I'm speaking very specifically about actions that the more you do them, actually the better you feel, the more alive you feel. And, you know, a heroin addict, and I have worked with people with substance abuse. Um, if you actually, if you actually like test their, um, their body, you muscle test their body, you know, they'll tell you it's the thing that I absolutely love, but the way that it actually starts to leave them feeling is just needing more of that momentary hit. Um, and so, you know, that would be my, my cause. On, those, on the sports stuff, I don't know where that leaves that guy. Sometimes in my experience with working with extreme athletes is that um, it does, <laughs> certain things do leave them feeling like nothing else in life really touches them. There's a certain kind of numbness which they just need more and more extremes. But I guess that's the way to, to be really mindful about how it leaves you feeling overall. You know, it's like, yeah. That makes sense. So it, 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 it's a really disciplined, discerning attention. Yeah. And I'm reminded too of, you know, I once heard one of my teachers said that there's only two causes of disease, <laughs> not enough of something or too much of something. Yeah, and absolutely. so on this call to aliveness, uh, just being aware of that. And when is for us something too much? Right? Absolutely. Um, and I mean, it's just the way, it's just the way that I guess, you know, you sit down and you eat a plate of donuts. It's delicious. And then you see how you feel. You sit down, you eat a wholesome, beautiful salad. Um, you see how you feel. And then over time, you realize that consistently eating that salad is the thing that really makes you feel better all the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you, you shared something in this direction, uh, something along these lines, just, just a few minutes ago, but I love the way that you phrase this about purposeful action toward an unknown purpose. Yeah. you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, that has been a, that has been a new, that, that particular languaging has been a, a new dimension for me, which began 
Um, and I just think it's an incredibly important idea. And the first time I heard about it, it was, it was in a story that was written in the late 1800s by this um, kind of crazy uh, scientist who was incredibly advanced. But the story goes uh, that I read in the book and where this phrasing originally came from. A young native boy uh, in the northern part of South Africa was taken from his home and his family. He was blindfolded. And this was during the time when the missionaries would take young children from, from their homes. Um, he's taken from his home um, and he was blindfolded. He was taken on a circuitous journey via train and vehicle of about 300 miles. The journey ended only about 50 miles from where he was originally taken, but it was distorted. The, the area was distorted by a mountain range. Sometime during the night, this boy escaped. And the next morning when they found his tracks and they tracked him, he walked on a direct route um, back to where his home was. And they were fascinated by how he had known how to do this, having been taken so far from it. He had never left his home before, moved around. And when they asked the boy about it, he just kept repeating, I did not know where my home was. I wanted to go home. And essentially what many, many very, uh, what native cultures has was, was the capacity for homing. And I'm fascinated by this idea. Something in him knew where his home was, not something rational. He did not know where his home was, but something in him knew and continued to walk him towards that. And so when we think of our healing journey or when we think of our transformational journey, I just think that's a fascinating idea that something in us knows not rationally. You can't say rationally when I'm transformed, I'll be like this. Something in us knows. And the real art form is to work out how to continue to move towards that thing. And it will start to show up as small daily actions um, that, you know, moment to moment, a kind of knowing of what we meant to do that is deeper than just the rational mind. Um, you know, there's also in the, in the wayfinder traditions, the Polynesian wayfinder traditions, uh, the wayfinder would sit on the front of the canoe and using the stars, but more using a feeling inside of himself, be able to pull the canoe towards an island thousands of miles away in the Pacific. The capacity to home, to, to move towards something. And I really think that that is the art of inner tracking, purposeful action towards an unknown purpose. Like, I don't know where I'm going, but I know exactly how to get there. And if you were to think of it more in, in Jungian terms from the, uh, you know, from the brilliance of Carl Jung, the psychotherapist, uh, he talked of, what he talked of was circumambulation. So his idea is that there exists a future self, which is almost you in your full potential, your full expression. And the way to get to that full expression of yourself in the future is to pay attention in the moment to what naturally draws your curiosity and what you feel naturally excited and pulled towards. And the more you do that in the moment, and the more you pay attention to that in the moment, the more you will be drawn via a spiral route through certain recurring themes that continuously deepen towards what feels fully like you. Um, and so that, that idea is fundamental to the path of the healer it's fundamental to what we're talking about because what, what modern culture would offer you was some idealized version of yourself that you have a goal to be, um, you know, and that would be the perfect you. And to me, that starts to fall down with what you're actually looking for is to go inward to a more whole you that you discover over time. Um, rather than trying to achieve a place you live moment to moment inside of an evolving relationship with yourself that starts to open you to deeper places. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard. It, and the thing that becomes hard about this brilliant and is that, you know, the language does break down a little bit because it's such a personal thing to go inward and continue to discover more of yourself yeah. and more of an expression of yourself. And so the versions of the language starts to break down around it because your way is unique. There's no yeah. model that I can put up for you and say, this is it. You know, that's why it becomes hard to talk about. It's not sure. fully 
um, it's your journey and it'll, yeah. it'll be different for everyone towards your medicine way, the track of your life. Yeah. No, that, that I get that. And you recognizing that, you know, that everybody's journey is different at some point, you know, it's kind of the Buddhist, the finger pointing at the moon. <laughs> yeah. We start looking at the finger and not at the moon. It's trying to, to show us and so forth. Um, but an idea that I found really useful and just, I don't know why it moves me so much, except I think looking back on my life, I could see it and I didn't have a, a, a word for it was yours. The, what you talk about, about the track of not here. Well, you mm -hmm. talk, because I think that's in this when we go, okay, when the language breaks down and what we were following is a line of teaching or a teacher that, who we were learning from or whatever, a community we were part of at some point that seems to me over and over again to ultimately become the track of like the track of not here. <laughs> well, like, I mean, it's such an important point because let's say you were out there tracking an animal. You've, you've gone without knowing, you know, you didn't know, you don't know where that animal is, but you set off. You've been working on first tracks. You've been developing your, your track awareness. And at a certain point, you're actually flowing on the track. And you see this with the trackers all the time. Their eye is catching the track. Um, they're doing a lot of things at once. They're waypointing off of trees up ahead. They're vectoring the direction of the track. They're almost playing on the track and things are moving. Suddenly we're moving quickly across unknown terrain. We're on the track of this animal. We can feel its movement and we're no, we know we're on track. And then suddenly, almost as you know as deep as you were in the flow you're out of it you've popped out we lose the track and it could be hard ground it could be that a herd of animals walked across the track i mean there are so many ways to lose a track and one of the critical things that i tell people is that losing the track is absolutely a part of tracking and you have to know this and it's the same in transformational processes you let go of the known you let go of where you felt safe you start moving towards, you know, what feels like your inner track, more energy, more curiosity. You know, you, you're starting to get into a place where you don't have as much identity and boom, suddenly you lose the track. It's very important to know that losing the track is a part of tracking. Um, when the trackers lose the track, they do a couple of interesting things. The first thing that they do is they will go back to where they last had a clear track. And so you might ask yourself in my transformational journey, I feel a bit lost now, but when was the last time I felt really on track? When was the last time I knew I was clearly on track? What was I doing? Who was I with? What was that activity? The other things that the trackers do is they start trying things. And this to me is so different from the Western way that we were talking about earlier of, I have to know what the next move is. They, they start trying things. They go up ahead, they check open uh, terrain. They'll, they'll walk down a game path where animals have walked. They'll check anywhere where they can get a bit of open terrain. They start looking for where grass has pushed that. They move forward, sometimes hundreds of yards, just looking if they can cut the track. Anywhere where they walk, they'll walk also walk like a sort of half circle. Anywhere where they walk, where they don't find the track, they don't consider it wasted time. Oh, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. There's no tracks here. I've lost the way. They consider all of that the, the path of not here. You know, anywhere where I walked that I didn't find the track is helping me refine where the track could be. Um, and so that, those dimensions become very, very important as we start, as we lose the track in our life. Okay, well, everywhere we didn't find it is helping us refine where it was. Try things, continue to move forward and try things, con continue to move and, and play curiously with an open awareness. Go back to where you had the last clear track, there's information there. But the key is not to become frozen in the idea that now I've lost the track, I, I've done it wrong and I have to do it right moving forward from here. Give yourself the space to like a tracker, just play, discover. And that's the thing about trackers is they live in discovery. They do not live in needing to be right or needing to know, they just, uh, operate with this open awareness. Uh, and all of this, this becomes so important when let's say you, let's say you had a, a job, you were in a career, things were going great, but something in you longed for something different. So you let go of the safety of the known and, and things were going well for a while. And then suddenly you ran into a place where, oh my gosh, I, I'm not sure. Was this right? Have I made, you know, that crisis of confidence that comes in a tra transformational process, what they call transformational tension. And it's important to know that being 
you know, having gone into it, things were going great and then losing the track. That's a part of it. You know, stay in the process, stay in the process, let yourself be in discovery. I love that. Okay. <clears throat> when, can, uh, you know, when your, when your process began, did you have any experience with that where it was like, you know, I'm, I'm so in this journey. This is so what I meant to do. This is so right. And then a big moment of like lost within that process. I mean, yeah, <clears throat> for me, man. And I, like, I, 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 I haven't figured out how to talk about this publicly much, <laughs> you know, because it involves divorce mm -hmm. and I don't. So the thing is I, I married nice woman. We had kids together, got about seven years in. I didn't realize how unhappy I was. Mm -hmm. I met someone new. I couldn't believe how alive I felt. That was more than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. That woman that I met that helped me feel alive is now my wife and best friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Again, it was like earlier used the phrase, you know, go to sleep, that part of us go to, go to sleep. I hadn't realized that. And that was my description of, I felt like a part of me woke up, like it was a physical feeling, mm -hmm. you know, and it, that was against a backdrop of tremendous difficulty. My dad had died. I'd had a son who was born with severe brain bleeds, spent nine months in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, I was in a job that I didn't love, but felt like I couldn't leave because it was part of a family business, you know? Um, so just a lot of things came together and, and really at a moment of, and, and previous to that, I had had suicide attempts. So I'd lived in some pretty dark places, not really knowing why I was here and all this. And, and that was one where it just felt like, wow, I didn't, you know, I didn't know this was possible. I, I had a sense every day as I was going through the routines of living that, you know, life wasn't great. I mean, I was playing mm -hmm. tremendous amounts of video games. <laughs> that was my coping. Sometimes there was gambling or sometimes there were other, you know, unhealthy behaviors. But, but that for me was a moment of, I, I think like hitting on a, a first track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds, and then, you know, in that sort of circumstance, you know, the lesson, is, it's such a deep lesson because it, it's the question is, is the lesson here to hold on or is the lesson here to let go? You know, and it sounds like in this case, your, your lesson was to let go and, and follow your new track. And it's yeah. these things, these things come in so many different ways and they ask such deep questions of us and there's no right or wrong answer. You just have to do the work of being in touch with yourself enough to know, you know, where, your track when you see it. Yeah. And that's a, yeah. And that's a really beautiful example of it. Yeah. And I feel now I say this, you know, for, for, well, for a long time, I've said like, I don't know why I do things. I mean, I can explain things, but I know those explanations are bullshit, <laughs> right? Like if I'm yeah. really honest, the answer is because I want to, or because I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Right. But uh, I've said recently as I've, I, I tend to think of it as honoring, you know, as I've honored this, these, these innate curiosities or impulses or whatever, that I feel like I'm having a second childhood. You know, like I'm just so yeah. grateful. Yeah. The aliveness, you know, the, I mean, curiosity, if you, if you're in a place where you can follow your curiosity, I think of curiosity as the way in which life pulls you towards a destiny beyond what you could rationally have imagined for yourself. And it's almost certain that you will be curious about things that are innate to you. Um, <clears throat> and I see this so consistently, you know, and, and you're a great example of it. Brilliant. Like I think of this, this work of finding your authentic track of finding the path of your own life. In my experience, it's a kind of modern day activism. It's not selfish. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, if I just wanted to do what I want all the time, it's not like that. When people start to really touch this authentic, true track, I see a few things happen. One is they become naturally more contemplative by, by nature. When people start to touch that. Two, there's a natural draw to nature. Hmm. Three, um, people stop wanting stuff. I, I really see this incredible thing that people stop wanting more things. Um, four, there's an innate and natural desire to serve or create some kind of um, offering for others. And five, there's a, there's a turn towards creativity. Um, and I just see it so consistently when people really touch the authentic life, 
they are not asking, what can I get? They are asking, what am I here to give? And it's, it's, it's so consistent in my coaching work, in my transformational work. Anytime people really get to this, you know, I just never saw anyone get there and say, now I know what I'm going to get out of this. You know, yeah. I, and now I know what I have to give to this. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think of it as a modern day activism because people who touch that place, you start to feel this, like what you're describing, this like curiosity, this gratitude, and they don't have to, they don't, they're not trying to pitch you to live like this. You just find yourself wanting to be around people like that and asking yourself, yeah. what's going on over there? <laughs> so naturally they start to draw people in, and, you know, around them, things start to change. And so I offer this to people, not just as your own path, but as a kind of activism. And I think that when a lot of people change, even if you just think about a lot of people wanting less stuff, yeah. that will have a profound impact on the environment that has a yeah. profound impact on, you know, a return to simplicity just takes us to different ways of living and we yeah. need different ways of living. Yeah. Because the model, the consumeristic model that we got offered, it's not leaving us fulfilled, enriched, and in communities that, that feel deeply connected. Yeah. You know, so this other way is we, we are, to me, we are living a different way of living into life. Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely want to ask you about this. And I, I actually get the chills just thinking about this, uh, recalling your story. But there was a, a moment when you heard, I don't know if you heard them audibly or you heard them in your mind, maybe you could talk about that, but you heard these four words, you are always safe. Would you be willing to talk about when and why you heard those words and what they've meant to you, what they meant to you then and what they've meant to you since? Uh, yeah, I mean, are you referring to um, the, the incident in the book where, with my, involving my family? Um, yeah, so what, what happened is that in, uh, I'm not sure which year it was, but it was at a time when South Africa was going through a very, very difficult time. Um, there was a lot of violent crime around. And uh, my family, it was myself and my sister and my mother and, and a woman who was a tutor for us. And we were home invaded and held up at gunpoint and tied up at a time when there was where that where those sorts of incidents were ending um, in extremely violent ways in South Africa. And so I woke up at gunpoint with my mother and my sister tied up um, around me. Um, and, you know, it's just an, an outrageously terrifying experience. Um, an experience that, you know, was so strange. And I had grown up around animals. And one of the things about animals is that they're extremely honest. They always tell you through their body language what their mood is. But when you have a violent encounter with people and especially and traumatized people, you know, cause you know, I don't, I don't harbor any judgment of the, of the people who held us up. I know they were traumatized by what the country had been through, but it's still terrifying because you don't know what a traumatized person will do. You can't read that language. And this ordeal went on for a number of hours. Uh, I was terrified about, you know, what would be done to my family. I was, I, I thought that we may well be killed at the end of it. Um, so it's just absolutely terrifying. And right at the end of it, uh, a, a group of these, these assailants took me outside and, you know, they told me they were going to kill me. And it's a, it's a, it's hard to describe, um, you know, what that feels like when you, you taken outside to essentially be executed. Um, but something happened to me in that moment, uh, as I went outside, I experienced some kind of shift in consciousness and it's very, it's hard to talk about, but the mystics, you know, do talk about it. Something happened and I just went out of all fear. You know, one of the ways that the mystics might say it is that the ego just couldn't hold the moment anymore. And so the ego ceased and there was just total fearlessness for a moment inside of that. I had all fear left me and what replaced it, was just an overwhelming sense of being connected to everything, including these men uh, in front of me who had me at gunpoint. And I looked, I looked into all of their eyes and all, all that was there was absolute love and surrender. 
And in that moment, uh, that's where I just knew you're always safe. And in that moment, <laughs> is a very weird thing happened. Like everyone, these guys who had had us at gunpoint been very aggressive everyone just became sort of confused. I don't know how else to describe it, but like the, any kind of action in the moment just dropped and, and these guys just kind of, they lost anything to push again. I don't know how, I don't know how to talk about it. It's just like everyone became confused and then they walked over to a vehicle and drove off. Wow. And um, it was a very, it was a very strange experience. And it took me, weirdly it took me almost more time to try and understand spiritually what had happened in that moment um then process the trauma i realized i processed some of the trauma but what i could never fully process was the scope of what i felt in that moment and it was like a glimpse into a certain kind of state and um, it was a strange moment to get it but yeah, it was right there at at my most terrified that suddenly a veil opened and i i touched you know, the Satori experience, maybe you would call it, or a glimpse of a different state. And, you know, it's just, I, I, I'm by no means make any claims uh, to it being more than a glimpse, but it, that's, it was, it has never left me. And it has, it has always, that moment has always filled me with, with a, a longing and a sense of perhaps a place that might be possible with enough disciplined uh, spiritual practice. Wow. You know, and thank you for sharing that. First of all, when you mentioned earlier in this interview, trauma, I suspect that, that was at least part, you know, part of it that you were referring to. And, and to hear you talk about it now, when you talk about it as a place, that was a place. Mm -hmm. That's something that struck me as I've learned about emotions and human experiences that we do. I tend to think of emotions as places, right? And that when we talk about, I was in a dark place, I was in a happy place, I was high, whatever. And that's so interesting to me to hear you just naturally sharing that experience that that was a place. And I don't, I'd be curious to know how you see this, but once you've gone somewhere, right, it's almost like you carry that place with you forever, right? Yes. Well, you know, I think of it as inner cartography in some ways. Um, and it's like um, we place flags, uh, you know, in certain places, if you could imagine like, Let's say I had a moment where my consciousness opened mm -hmm. uh, to that state of total divine connectedness and safety. And, and then it receded, but, but it was a place that I know exists there. And, you know, there's a place where perhaps you've felt incredible open heartedness that you couldn't live in, but you had touched it. Yeah. And there's a place where you've touched profound fear and all of, all of the spiritual journey is realizing that, um, you know, there's some distance. It's not, not I am depressed. Uh, I'm experiencing depression. Um, not I am anxious. Uh, I'm anxiety is now moving through, you know, so again, it's fairly Eastern, but all of that is the capacity to watch these places move through us rather than be fully identified with them. And that is the, the experience of starting to develop more spaciousness in our spiritual practice. Um, so yeah, it's, it is a place it's marked and I'm not there, but I know it's yeah. out there and I'll keep yeah. sitting still until I can, you know, hopefully one day abide there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Build, build at least a yeah. summer cottage there. Or something. Yeah. It's a place that would that'd be nice to visit more often for sure. <laughs> yeah. But in the meantime, I'd settle for bringing home the little spoons <laughs> and putting them on the refrigerator. Yeah. I mean, in the yeah. meantime, I just, you know, happy that any day that I get to without being neurotic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, on that topic, just as you bring this up, somewhere in what you wrote, I read something you, I don't know if it was your original thought or you were quoting someone, but you talked about neurosis is a substitute for real suffering. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, it's just something that, uh, that has become really clear to me. Uh, how do, what's the best way to describe it? Um, I have found that, you know, when I have been incredibly engaged in true challenge mm -hmm. um, or in or feeling very tangibly connected to my life and having to deal with things, like, for example, I just lived for 40 days and 40 nights alone in the wilderness, living up in a tree. Um, and 
every day spending on the ground tracking, um, you know, foraging, uh, being aware, making sure that, you know, nothing ate me or just being attuned to, to nature, dealing with storms, dealing with heat, um, making sure that, you know, I was taking care of myself as I moved through the wilderness, all those sorts of things. And it's just incredible to see how every day when we are tangibly involved in, in having to work through those sorts of things, there's just a, a density of anxiety that starts to drop away. And we live in a society that is obsessed with, with convenience. And I think that in some ways, convenience starts to, I don't know, it starts to, we, things are so convenient that we actually start to feel a little bit detached from life. Every day we get up, we work in a digital ether and things happen, but nothing ever really happens. And that can start to bring up um, a certain level of neuroses. Like, for example, um, I think of, I was just in, I was just in a storm in the tree and it's late afternoon and the wind started to blow and I realized there's a huge storm coming in and I start to button down the hatches. I start to, um, I start to, like, you know, do everything I can to prepare for the storm and this monster of a storm hits and blades of lightning coming down around me. And I don't know if you've ever been very close to a lightning strike, but it goes, it goes, click. there's like the strange sound as it touches down, just a little click next to you. Click. And then the thunder goes after that. But when it's very close, you hear a touch. Tick. It's, it's absolutely terrifying. And as I sat through, you know, three and a half hours of the storm, I was absolutely terrified. And I realized it's quite, rare to be truly afraid as an adult you know you don't it's like truly afraid and it is so different from ruminating in anxiety yeah um and another way to say it is you know out there in the wilderness you experience clean pain or, or what i would call clean fear and dirty fear you know clean mm -hmm. fear would be you know you you get close to a lioness and she has cubs and she drops her head down and she starts to snarl at you and you realize you're getting a message and you feel your adrenaline spike. You feel your awareness attuned. You, you realize there's danger and you start to move away from it. And that's actually a very healthy kind of fear. It's starting to show you like, you should be careful here. Mm -hmm. um, dirty fear is when you think when you're lying back in your bed, up in your tree house, thinking that lioness is out there. She's going to get me that lies you anything, you know, she could be waiting around the corner. Maybe she's going to, you know, and you start to then play it in the verbal mind continuously. And so maybe that's the essence of what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Actually, there's a strange thing, you know, we, when we live in the future fear or the past fear mm -hmm. that actually dissipates when we're actually handling a situation live, yeah. And that's what I mean. Neuroses is a, is a substitute for real suffering. Actually, when you are suffering and you have to handle something, you're actually kind of quite engaged by it. Yeah. But it's the story of it over the next years that starts to become neuroses. Yeah, absolutely. I have a teacher who said, <laughs> I love to explore this with people, but he says, nothing is upsetting in the present. And it was like, well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, people go, you know, what about when you're being tortured? It's like, but if you're imagining it, you're not in the present. <laughs> you know, my, um, my grandfather died when uh, my father was 15. And so there's, there's been this story, there's been this mythology uh, in our family of like the sudden loss via heart attack. From the time I was young, I knew the story because it really started my family business on its journey, the loss of, you know, my grandfather. And so I've lived with this, you know, the story and, you know, the story, the family all has heart issues. And so I've had this lifelong fear, this lifelong fear of like suddenly losing my father to a heart attack. And it's a very masculine fear. And it's, you know, he's my dad and we have an incredible relationship. And you know, I realized I've lived with it for years. And last year in November, uh, it happened. He had a heart attack, which he survived and he was okay. But what was incredible was that while it was happening, this, this huge fear was being realized and there was no fear. There was just presence and action coming out of that presence and doing what I needed to do. And it was just like a phenomenal moment to me to see 
to see an exact, the exact example of that. You know, there was in the moment there was presence and, and no fear. And in all the times before there was a story of fear. And so just wow. to what your teacher said. So you were there with him in the moment it happened. I was there in the moment it happened. Holy cow. And, um, what were you doing? And, I, you know, I, I was downstairs. My, my sister came in and said, you got to get upstairs. I walked in, I looked at him. I knew exactly what was happening and just went into action, managed to get him into the car, managed to get him to the hospital, managed to scream at everyone in the, in the emergency room. And then a very lovely nurse screamed at me and sat me down and, uh, you know, it, it couldn't have gone better. But that moment of like getting him into the car, driving, you know, through the traffic to the, it was just pure. I know what I need to do now. I'm present. And uh, yeah, I just, I think a lot about that. Uh, our story of what's happening versus what's actually happening. Yeah. Wow. So Boyd, I feel, I'm feeling in this moment, like I've done a horrible job pacing this interview because <laughs> what, what I still want to touch on and you can help me determine what we talk about and how long or whatever. Um, I definitely want, if you're willing to speak a bit about Londolozzi. And yeah, so that's one thing. Another is I, I at least want to point this out that you just mentioned you spent 40 nights, 40 days, 40 nights in a treehouse. People can follow along on your journey by listening to your track, your life with Boyd Vardy podcast, which is yes. pretty amazing. So I, I want to make sure people know that. Um, another thing is, with um, your online course. I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about that. And then the last two parts of the interview that normally still take about another hour. We, we definitely, I know we don't, we won't spend that, but there's one that's the enlightening lightning round. It's nine questions, usually takes 20 minutes. And the last part is about writing and creativity. So I've kind of stacked it, but that's what, and, and in all of that, if there's anything else that we haven't touched on, I know we've covered a lot. But if there's anything else that you want to talk about, I want to make space for that too. So where should we go Beautiful. from here? Well, I mean, maybe as a part of this, I will talk a little bit about how Londolozzi affected me. And you'll remember at the beginning of the interview, I talked about, you know, growing up with the trackers and then getting, having this encounter with an inner tracker and starting to see how those went together. Mm -hmm. And the third part of that equation towards my life path was this place where I grew up, Londolozzi Game Reserve. And the story uh, of Londolozzi begins in 1926 with my great grandfather drinking uh, too many gin and tonics and hearing about this uh, part in the wild Eastern part of South Africa that was up for sale. And it was, and, a and Boyd, I, I'm sorry to, to, to interrupt, but as you tell this, I just want to frame this for people that the place still exists and they can come visit. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so it's as been, people hear this history, be aware, this is not like in the past, this thing happened, but this is a place that's very much alive today and you are welcome to come. Very much alive. Um, and what it was, it was a bankrupt cattle farm. The land was bankrupt and the cattle had been overrunning it attached to the Kruger national park in the wild parts of South Africa. And my family went there in the 1926 consciousness of hunting and particularly to hunt lions. That was the mentality of that time. And thank goodness we've come a long way since then. But um, what happened was is my grandfather, my, my great grandfather went there to hunt. My, my grandfather grew up hunting there and my father and uncle grew up hunting there. And one of the things that had happened is as the cattle had grazed the, the land bare, uh, a thick scrub had come up as the, as the rain falls, when it's been uh, overgrazed, um, the water can't sink down into the ground. And so you get this incredible runoff and scrub land starts to replace the grassland. And so at that time, there were very few animals there. And most of the place was eye high scrub. And so if you saw a few animals while you were down there, that was, you know, considered lucky, but they were there. You just couldn't see them. And that went on until 1969. And in 1969, my grandfather died very suddenly. And my father and uncle were left with this bankrupt cattle farm. And all of the family advisors said, well, first things first, you got to get rid of that place. You know, hunting lions is dangerous. It's a bad idea. And that's, you know, there's scrub land all over there. There's no value there. Get rid of it. And they stood up and from a place very deep inside of them, and that's the place I've always been interested in, purposeful action towards an unknown purpose, they said, 
we want to keep it. We feel something inside of ourselves. That's our track. We're keeping that place. And there were big arguments with family advisors, but eventually their mother said, if the boys want to keep it, we'll keep that place. And, and the boys also said, we'll make it pay. Because everyone said to them, well, how are you going to look after your mother now? And that's how my family got into the safari business. And it was a very ramshackle operation, three mud huts, nothing really going on, the odd sighting of an animal, um, until the arrival there of a man called Ken Tinley. And Ken was a phenomenal guy. He was a high school dropout who had been admitted to university because he drew a picture of a moth with such intricate detail that the dean of the faculty put him in. And then after that, he had gone to live alone in a part of Mozambique, and he had lived alone for a year to do his PhD. And during that time, he had developed this incredible connection with landscape. It's like he could feel the landscape in his own body. And he arrived at this rundown scrub encroach property where my father and my uncle were trying to get things going. And he said to them, if you want this place to work, you need to restore the land. You need to think of the animals as your kin. And you need to make sure that the local Shangan people participate in the protection and well-being of this land. And so they said, we'll restore the land. How do we do that? And Ken started to show them how you could clear the scrub away and start to pack it into where you were losing moisture in these deep erosive furrows. And as you did that, the, the grassland started to return. So what I grew up inside of was watching the work of restoring that land um, like deeply in practice. And we, I would go to a piece of land as a boy and I would see scrub land and then I would watch teams go in and clear it. And I would think now this looks like a wasteland, everything cut out of the ground. And then a year later, I would go back to that same place and I would see a grassland. And as the grasslands returned, you know, you would start to see zebra and wildebeest returning and suddenly animals started to appear. Rhinos started to appear. We got the fence with Kruger National Park down and the elephants flowed back onto the land. And then in a really beautiful mystery, the leopards, wild leopards there started to realize that we meant them no harm. The hunting was long gone. And in fact, we were building a relationship with the land and the leopards started to allow themselves to be seen. And so I grew up inside of a restoration of nature. That was the third you know, part of the story. And I, I have felt like I have seen the possibility of, of, building our relationship with nature and restoring our relationship with nature. And, and when any of us invo get involved in the act of inner tracking or inner healing, I believe we become a part of that restoration process. And today, Londolozi is, you know, the model for conservation and restoration movement in the world. It's a teeming wilderness. The animals are protected. Um, the animals are considered kin. And it's a place where you can come and have an encounter with a wild animal where it's totally wild, no fences, totally open, but they realize that we mean them no harm and they allow themselves to be seen. And so that, that's the place that exists both as my home, but also as a place inside of me that I uh, am trying to recreate all over the world, a place where we are involved in the restoration of the planet. I love that. I want to visit. I've yeah, you got to get out there. Yeah, yeah I'd I love want... to show you around. I, I would love it. I, I had a chance to do a safari in Tanzania and to visit Kenya, but I have never been to South yeah. Africa and looking at what you've got online and hearing your story. I, I definitely want to come. Got to so, get you out there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe this is a good spot too. If you would be willing to, to share about your online program, I imagine anybody who's listened this long is, is probably interested in learning more from you. So tell us about what you've created online. You know, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about it. It's a, it's an eight module. You could do it over eight weeks or you can do it all in one go. Um, and what it is, it's an online program that allows you to walk through. And we realized we couldn't get everyone to Londolozi. We couldn't get everyone tracking, but we could, you know, via this incredible channel of the internet, start to give people access to the approach and the mentality of becoming an inner tracker and living as an inner tracker. And so what the course will do, it will start to tune you into that way of thinking. It will allow you via journaling activities to refine and define and start to build awareness around the tracks that you're looking for, tr tracks you've been on on the past. It will try and help you identify roles and, uh, and traumas that may be free freezing you. 
it will tune you back into the somatic landscape of your body and get you in tune with that. And so it's a, and, and there's an amazing thing when you sit down and you start to write into these prompted questions, it starts to pull your mind. Uh, you know, I always think of writing as discovering what you think about things. So there's something really powerful about writing versus thinking about it. You start to discover like, okay, and you start to be able to see what your tracks have been and what they might be in the future. So I think it's a really powerful tool for people who can't get out to South Africa or can't get uh, tracking with us a way for them to have an opportunity to do some inner discovery. And so we're very excited about sharing that now. And uh, you can find it at, at boydvati.com and you can start to work through it and, and see where it takes you inside yourself. That's awesome. I, I think this is a program I would love because in the Lions Tracker, in the Lion Tracker's Guide to Life, I love what you say about coaching where you write something about the whole business of life coaching never quite sat well with me. Coming from the South African Bushveld, I felt pretty certain life did not need a coach. The unbroken stream <laughs> of life that animates all things is supremely intelligent and nothing in the wild needs a coach to help it discover what it truly is. So for my part, I love that someone has written a program with that mentality you know, coming from that place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it is funny that we have a life coach and, you know, I, I coach a lot of people, um, but it's, it's less of, it's, it's, it's more about discovering what's innately there. You know, it's not about fixing something or, you know, changing something it's there inside of you and, yeah. and it's naturally there inside of you. It's, it's more about what you can shed uh, yeah. than anything. Yeah, that's right. And I love that description about knowledge accumulates in wisdom, <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> like sets down. But I also love too, in, in that same book, you write, wildness is a relationship with aliveness. Too much uncertainty is chaos, but too little is death. <laughs> it's like, what a great yeah. description. So, okay. Um, all right. With your permission, then I want to go ahead and transition us to the enlightening lightning round. All righty. I'm doing excited okay? about this. Okay, yeah, cool. thank you. Good. Okay. Question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a evolving journey towards the expression of more essence. Okay. Question number two, here I'm borrowing technologist and investor Peter Thiel's question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? What important truth do very few people agree with me on? I would say that um, does not matter what your, what your circumstances are, the journey of essence can begin anywhere. And, uh, you know, I guess I'll just leave it at that because I've had enough people say to me, well, well, you know, I would do this if I were, if I could, if I, and then I've seen hundreds of people uh, who didn't have the means in inverted commas, who weren't in a good situation to st just start and, and go there. So uh, a lot of people would probably disagree with me on that. Yeah. Question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a phrase on it or a saying or a quit or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Uh, towards aliveness. All right. Question number four, what book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? For me, my favorite book is the book called the snow leopard by Peter Matheson. And I guess on some level, everything I've ever written has just been an attempt to, to get close to writing something like the snow leopard. It's just a, it's a book that I don't know why his journey into the Himalayas and his observations, the beauty of it is just, it's just touches me. Mm -hmm. What are you currently reading? Um, right now I am reading two books. The one is tribe by Sebastian Junger. And the second is a, in a book called Awareness by Anthony DeMello, uh, who is a Jesuit priest who I think was pretty awake. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Question number five. So you've traveled a ton. Case in point, 
I thought you would be in South Africa for this interview, but you surprised me and you're in Austin. <laughs> so you travel a lot. What's something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? I mean, I have a practice that I take everywhere with me that is, um, I, this is my workbook and I question, it's the work of Byron Katie. Um, it, I question my thoughts using her system. I question thoughts that cause me suffering and I get anxious when I travel. And so I question my anx anxious thoughts when they come up. And so I don't go anywhere without identifying the thought that's causing me suffering and then and then sitting inside of of her practice of questioning that that belief mm. okay heard a lot of answers to that question nobody's provided that <laughs> response <laughs> that's great okay question number six um what's something you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well wow i mean i've started fasting uh, very, very regularly. Um, I fast probably intermittently four days, four or five days a week. And then I fast 36 hours, um, once a month at least. Um, so that has been a, a big one for me. Um, I would say that has probably been, been one of the most profound ones. I feel fundamentally different having really begun that practice. So that would be one that I've started. Um, what have I stopped? I mean, I have just, for me, diet is obviously a very big thing, particularly traveling. And so I just don't eat. Uh, I just eat clean. You know, I'm mm. very, very disciplined about eating clean. Mm. All right. Question number seven. What's one thing you wish every American knew? Wow. That is, I mean, that is, that's a big one, right? Um, I guess what I would say is I wish every American knew and had the opportunity to be attuned to what we call in, in Africa, Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a, an idea and a consciousness that is what I would think of as the we consciousness rather than the I consciousness. Ubuntu says, it is through our interactions with other people that we experience our own humanity. Um, Ubuntu says uh, people are not people without other people. So I would, if I, if I could offer one thing to, to the United States, it would be to inhabit that we consciousness more um, and feel that sense of, we need each other despite our views, despite our differences to be human together. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Question number eight what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? Slow down. Um, that's been, that's been my practice. I'm, I'm, it's a continued practice. Uh, I'm someone who tends to jump around, lot, be interested in doing a lot of things, talk too fast, want to, you know, jump around subjects. And I've realized that, when I slow down, there's the capacity to bring reverence and honor and, and real listening to the conversation. And if I'm moving too fast, uh, I can't get into that state of consciousness that is where relationships are truly fostered. Mm -hmm. So slow down has been my practice in relationship. Awesome. And question number nine, aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money? Or what's something you're always sure to do with it or you never do with it? Um, okay, that one is an interesting one. Um, I would say that money, the money game has something to do with what you can normalize. And so uh, it's a strange, it's a strange thing. It, it, to me, it's just uh, money is a kind of energy and it's a state of consciousness and it arises to what feels normal to you, which is why people who make, you know, huge sums of money and then lose it, remake it again, because that's just a part of the game for them. And they've been there, you know, that type of inner mapping. Mm -hmm. um, Martha, my mentor once told me a story. She was friends with uh, the actress who played Princess Leia. Her name is Carrie, is Carrie now. Fisher. Carrie Fisher. Mm -hmm. And she asked Carrie Fisher, like, why did you become a movie star? And she said, 
well, everyone in my family was a movie star. So to her, to something that was miles away for other people, like going to Hollywood and becoming a movie star, for her, it was so normal that that's what she became. And I feel that life has a strange way of doing that. What we normalize is where we sort of find ourselves. And so part of the money game is, is, you know, you have to do the work of normalizing uh, a certain level of flow. That's an interesting way to say that. <laughs> I, I like that. Uh, and there's a lot there too, related perhaps to identity, you know, who we yes. know ourselves to be and that. Yeah. Okay. Question number 10. If people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, what would you have them do? I mean, the best way is, um, you know, via boydvati.com, very connected with people uh, through that. Um, and I would say that if, you know, if they're interested in the work of, of l- learning quickly the foundations of what I'm trying to offer and what I'm offering that we can explore together is start with the online course because it's going to give you a foundational uh, space of understanding and language that we can then meet in uh, as we go forward. So that's, that's why I really have designed it is so that people can get it from whatever level they're at, having never been in the wilderness, they can start to get into the mentality of the tracker, um, which I think is a really fun way to live. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And although I do have a few questions for you about writing and creativity, uh, before we go there, I just want to let you know that uh, as an expression of gratitude to you for making time to share with me your experience and your wisdom Uh, with me and everyone listening. I have made a micro loan through Kiva.org to a woman entrepreneur named Giomar in Timor-Leste. She's 46 years old. She grows vegetables and sells them at her local market. So she'll use this money to buy fertilizer and seeds and equipment. So thank you for giving me a reason to to go make that. Thank you for for, um, allowing me to participate in that abundance, you know? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. So f- coming down the stretch final, oh my gosh, we could do, we could easily do an hour on, on this al- alone. Um, I have so many questions. Let me just rattle a few off and you can answer any of them or something else. What have you learned about storytelling? What have you learned about writing stories? Uh, after tracking a lion, you became obsessed with writing. Like, what was that like? Uh, have you, what challenges have you experienced writing about your family and people, you know, what have you learned in the process of writing two books? Uh, what technology do you do? Do you use? And then whatever we answer, we'll end with advice and encouragement for other, other writers. So where should we go? Wow. I mean, some, some big ones there. Um, well, I mean, the first thing that I've learned that, is, that every book is a ceremony that, and it, you think you're writing the book, but the book is also, working on you, the process of creating it, the process of getting it out, you know, it's, that has been really, really big. Um, the second thing that I've learned is it's different for everyone, but I have to take time to give myself some structure to write to. For me, structure is freedom. Um, the more of a framework that I can, a broad framework I can get, the more creative I become within the bounds of that framework per chapter, per, uh, per, you know, offering. Uh, I've learned that whipping myself that I should be writing um, is never going to help me generate more writing. The the critical voice of that, when I'm not writing, it seem it doesn't actually seem to take me towards more writing. I have to, to really be disciplined about, making sure that there's a generative voice that is saying we will, we will get to it. It comes when it comes, you can trust yourself to keep sitting down. Um, Not you're not writing, you're not writing, you're not writing. Cause I find myself rebelling then against that tyrant and not writing. So that would be one. Um, I, I have found that some stories, uh, some stories are really given to me. You know, it's a wonderful thing about being a storyteller is if I'm attuned to it, certain stories are given to me. I I don't know how else to describe it, but like there are some that come that are just really given, but the more that I sit down to write, the more are given, (laughs) you know, any, any anecdote through the day. um, Once I start to write is I start to see how rich it was. So there's a lot to be said for, 
you know, those, those, uh, the willingness to continuously sit down and actually start to write, write even little anecdotes. This- yeah. Well, and what a perfect example too, of what you were saying of track awareness. Yes. That here, the more you're attuned to the stories, the more they're given to you. Totally. And, yeah. and, uh, yeah, something to me, like something, you know, nothing bad ever happened to a writer. That's the, <laughs> that old classic. <laughs> You know, and I can, and I've gotten to that point now where I can feel like when things are going a little like, oh, this is not so fun. I can feel like there's a good story here. And growing up in the safari business, which is an anecdote fest, you know, the safari business just throws stories at you because things happen every day. Um, you know, I really do live in that sense of like when when things are going wrong, what's there's a good one here. You know, that's so that's been wonderful. Um, what have I missed? What have I missed there? I wonder. If there's something specific about storytelling, I'll give you maybe an example of something. And I want to say this too, because so I'm going to come back to that. But I interviewed a mentor of mine, uh, a guy named Marshall Goldsmith, who's written multiple New York Times bestsellers, and he has a writing partner. And he said something when I interviewed him for this show that I thought was really interesting. He, you know, he's a PhD, really smart guy. He can write well. He's got the discipline and, and clarity of thought and all that. But he said, he said, brilliant. I'm a good writer but I'm not a literary quality writer. He said, that's mm-hmm. for me. He said, I'm fortunate because my writing partner is that. And as I read your work, Boyd, it's my estimation that you are, and I know there's other people involved in the process, right? In a book, editors and so forth. But my sense of, as I think I heard your voice through your writing is that you are a literary quality writer. Like your descriptions are beautiful and you know they're, they're not just two dimensional. And so the thing about storytelling, like I've heard people tactically go, know your beginning and endings, you know, know the transformation, the inciting incident, like stuff like this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's any like little hacks or I don't know, heuristics that you use to tell a story, but that's one one component of the question. The other is, is there anything that you would offer writers who, because you talked about with Peter Matheson and the snow leopard, like you're writing, you wanted to be him, but ultimately we're all only ourselves. Mm -hmm. But is there anything that you would offer about like approaching literary quality writing as a writer, like, especially as a storyteller? Wow. I mean, the first thing is, is that, you know, that's, that's such a wonderful thing for you to say. And because I don't feel like, like one of those just like high level literary writers, I feel like a campfire storyteller, who writes, you know, and um, so I never think of myself as like New York intellectual uh, strength writer or, you know, like these incredible literary type people. Um, but I guess what I would say is that what, what has helped me is um, an instinctual sense of what the story is mm-hmm. that comes from like really kind of shooting the shit around the fire a lot. Uh-huh. And, and that is actually, you know, when I'm around a fire and it gets going and you start to talk about things and if you get a few great storytellers, it starts to feed off each other. You know, I can hear what's landing on my ear as I'm talking out loud. And that has really helped me develop my voice. Hmm. Um, so I would say to, you know, writers, like, I know that sometimes the writing thing is about being inward and being alone, but like, you know, if you can get into an environment that is supportive where you can hear your own voice in story out loud, uh-huh. that can also be a doorway. Um, so, so, you know, maybe something in that is what I would offer to people to play yeah. with that a little bit, to just hear how one word that is unexpected uh, lands on your ear, you know, like something like um, when I looked up the Buffalo was adjacent You know, it's so different to the Buffalo was close to me. The Buffalo was now in proximity. It was adjacent. You know, it's suddenly just like a word like that can change the feeling of the the sentence. Yeah. Uh, And you get that by being out loud. Mm. No, I I like that. Tell me about what was your, I think the word you used was obsession, right? Like there was something that happened and then you just got in like in a mode where you wrote intensely. Yeah. What talk about that. I wanted to write a book about the things that we've been talking about today, inner tracking, finding your way. You know, I had a series of essays. I had a series of, you know, different thoughts, you know, thoughts for like transformational processes for men. You know, it was like, I was in this very masculine place where I was wanting to create 
uh, certain things in my life and it was all kind of going on. Mm-hmm. Um, wanted to write a book about tracking trackers. Was it a book about trackers, a number of different trackers? Uh, woke up one morning, got together with my friends and went and tracked a lion. Uh, and, you know, suddenly the whole structure of the book was there on this one, this one track. And wow. I just realized like, that's it. That's what, that's everything I need to say has played out here today. And it was just like one of those great moments was like, there was my structure. Um, and, it, and just the minute I had that structure, I just couldn't wait to go. And this is after a few years of, you know, living in the, in the land of, I should be writing. What is it? I don't know what it is. Itchings, little, you know, vignettes not happening. Mm-hmm. And suddenly like the most obvious thing, a book about tracking, you know, a book about tracking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it's amazing how it comes, but that's how it came for me. And then I, and then it just had to come out and it came out fast and, and with absolute flow. That's awesome. In, especially in the cathedral of the wild, you share a lot of stories about your family. And I know this from my, my uh, endeavors to write, you know, stories about people I know about real people and so forth. What challenges, if any, did you encounter talking about, you know, people that you knew were going to read <laughs> what you were writing about them. You know, I was, I was lucky with, with that. My family were extremely supportive. And I think that there was certain, you know, there was actually certain catharsis in, you know, my dad read the book a lot and, and a lot, some of it was about his journey and, you know, I would go outside and he'd be crying reading a section of it. And it was it, in my case, it was very beautiful. I was lucky. My sister said that, I ruined her intrigue going on dates because people had this whole like backstory on her, but you know, it is, it's, it's definitely tricky. I on cathedral, it wasn't tricky, but you know, when you start writing about people, like, you know, people uh, have strange things that come up for them around the way they portrayed, but you have to write as honestly as you can and tell your story. And that's, that's where ultimately that's where it lands. Um, and then you hope that you have editorial support. And again, you don't have to do it all alone or people who help you find your way into, you know, what maybe doesn't feel totally right. Or so it's a, it's a dance. It's a dance. Yeah. You got to tell your story and then you've got to also ask yourself, what are the, what are the consequences of my view on this? And it might be, you know, the, the lesson there might be, uh, I've got to, I've got to go with my view or the lesson might be, you know what, this is not may- maybe not mine to say. And I think that's where just being in touch with your own integrity is important. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, the last question then that I'll ask for now, (laughs) I hope there's a part two (laughs) at some point, but uh, what advice or encouragement would you give to those who are either in the middle of their own creative project, you know, maybe their own book or even something else, or it's a dream they've harbored for a long time that they haven't really embarked upon? Um, I would say it's never going to be the right time. Um, and if you can, if you can get someone around you quickly, who believes it's possible, particularly if you haven't, you know, if you've done done it before, you know, people who have been involved in producing books, they know it's possible. They, they've done it. They've been there. Whereas if you've never been there, it is Mount Everest. You want someone who's been up to the top of that mountain and back a few times and knows we can do this. That's what made a big difference for me is my first editor, a woman called Betsy Rappaport. Um, She was just, she just knew we were going to get a book out. And, you know, when I was like, I've never done this, it's too big. I don't know what the structure is. She was like, we're going to get a book out. Some of it, you're going to write for a while. It's going to be bad. Then it's going to get good. And we're going to get a book out. (laughs) And just that made a huge difference to me. It's like Carrie Fisher knowing like, you're going to be a movie star. The people around her, that was normal for them. So find So, yeah, I, that, that's what I'd say. Like, find someone who it's not Mount Everest to, it's totally normal to, and pull them close to you. That's awesome. That's yeah. great. <laughs> well, Boyd, I have so much enjoyed, um, you know, getting to know you through your writing and in in this conversation today, and listening to your your podcast. I love that you took a kettlebell <laughs> out of the tree <laughs> with you. Uh, I really enjoyed that. So, thank you so much for for making time to connect, and I'm looking forward to staying connected in some ways. Thanks. Brilliant. And yeah, it'd be great to get you to South Africa and show you some of the work we're doing on the ground there. Yeah. I want to do that. So oh, man, absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, I will talk to you later, my friend. Thanks so much. Great all to right. be with you all. Hey 
Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the School for Good Living podcast. Before you take off, I just want to extend an invitation to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life still isn't working for many people. Whether it's here in the developed world where we deal with depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, divorce, unfulfilling jobs or relationships that don't work, or in the developing world where so many people still don't have access to basic things like clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or they live in conflict zones, there are a lot of people on this planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, or even if your life is working, but you have the sense that it could work better, consider signing up for the School for Good Living's Transformational Coaching Program. It's something I've designed to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated, or you've gone through a divorce, or you've gotten married, headed into retirement, starting a business, been married for a long time, whatever. No matter where you are in life, this nine-month program will give you the opportunity to go deep in every area of your life, to explore life's big questions, to create answers for yourself in a community of other growth-minded individuals. And it can help you get clarity and be accountable to realize more of your unrealized potential. It can also help you find and maintain motivation. In short, it's designed to help you live with greater health, happiness, and meaning so that you can be, do, have, and give more. Visit goodliving.com to learn more or to sign up today.